Dear Father, I thank you for this time we can preview the lesson, even in the midst of this pandemic. Oh, we are so glad that we will spend the quarter studying about the scriptures and the Bible. The only thing that today will stand because they are your words and they are your promises. May we be drawn closer to you by reading your word. And in this crisis, may your word give us peace and security as we trust in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, welcome to our living room. Uh, Tim is telling me, Tim is like a cameraman, that this will probably be the last because we go back to recording facilities in church. For a while we were getting very concerned because of the social distancing required by the state. So our conference uh, discouraged a lot of the churches not to meet and the people not even to go to church premises. But, uh, Looks like that's been relaxed, so we will probably go back to our recording facilities. But the blessing in disguise is you can at least see us in our living room here. I'll be more personal in our study for this morning. So our quarterly deals with the Bible. And in the second lesson is the origin and nature of the Bible. I'd like to open up with this uh, John Hopkins statistics uh, panel. I know you guys have been following this. If you will notice, we are now up to 1.159 million in confirmed cases of COVID-19, the coronavirus. Uh, uh, John Hopkins will tell you there's 62,376 deaths and 237,000 recovered. This was captured about 11.43 this morning. So this is real. Uh, the, the pandemic uh, is really hurting people, not only physically, but uh, even the, econom the economy of, of nations in, in America here in the U.S. will be hit very hard. Uh, the only good news here is, <laughs> uh, I was looking for the slide for this, but I couldn't find it in their chat room. I, we have a chat, our uh, Bible study group in Manila, and somebody posted a, a picture where they've run out of Bibles in one of the Walmarts because uh, the Bibles were sold out, I guess. I mean, aside from toilet paper, paper, you know, the paper towel and hand sanitizers and face masks selling out, what we really need to sell out today is the scriptures because uh, this is a time when you're faced with a crisis and the reality of death and sickness and pain where people are called back to God. So on that note, we will begin our lesson preview today with the origin and the source of the Bible. This is a, an interesting statistics. They said a survey of graduating high school seniors revealed that more than half thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. The Bible Society found that almost a third, 29% of children ages 8 to 15 did not know that the nativity story is biblical. 6% of children believe Hercules to be a scriptural character, while over half, 54% of parents, asked, thought that the Hunger Games could be a biblical story. <laughs> Roughly one in five teens believe the Bible is not divinely inspired. Uh, it's amazing in a country where we're overflowing with the Bible, you know, Bible for women, Bible for sports aficionados, Bible for men, Bible for young people, all sorts of Bible. The biblical illiteracy is just amazing, to say the least. It's, it, uh, uh, one guy, his name is uh, David Van Biema, said two-thirds of Americans believe the Bible holds the answers to all or most of life's basic questions. About half of them don't know that Genesis is the first book of the Bible. Uh, there is an alarming, alarming reality in the country today. Uh, people don't care so much about the Bible. I'm, I'm hoping that somehow this COVID-19 will be a blessing in disguise where we end up having more people go to the scriptures. I'll begin with this very famous quote from Mark Twain. He says that it's not the things which I do not understand in the Bible which trouble me, but the things which I do understand. What Mark Twain is saying is, I, I'm not talking about Greek and Hebrew. I'm not talking about uh, 
very profound and deep ideas in the scriptures. <laughs> I'm talking about very plain teachings of the scriptures and uh, a lot of them make me uncomfortable just because we have very disobedient hearts. Um, another survey, this is a pie chart that uh, was conducted and by Lifeway. And if you notice, the uh, question is how much of the Bible have you personally read? An alarming 30% say they only read several passages or stories. People haven't really taken Bible reading that serious. So hopefully after our quarter on the scriptures and the Bible, things will change uh, along with this uh, global crisis in health that we have. There are some important facts uh, about the Bible. Uh, it's written over approximately 1,600 years, from 1500 BC to 8000, written over 60 generations, written by 40 authors, written on three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, yet there is only one theme. Uh, we will elaborate on that more. And if there's a flow of God's revelation, uh, the assumption is basically God is a lot bigger than man, like the scriptures say, higher than the heavens from the earth as are, are, my, are my thoughts higher as are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So without without aid from God, we will not understand Him. So revelation came, and God reached down to men so we can understand Him. This is the flow of what transpired so that we can know who God is and even find salvation in our sinful state. Uh, you see that we begin with God's thoughts, which is uh, then a revelation, he manifests himself and reveals himself to man. And then uh, prophets and apostles are chosen to receive God's thoughts. This is what we call inspiration. And then these prophets and apostles eventually write, autograph, original manuscript of what they've been taught by God to revelation. And that's what we call a canonizing or canonicity of books. And then uh, people then go into all these uh, manuscripts to identify and collect the books of Scripture. And that's what we call textual criticism. Okay. Uh, which, which looks into the Hebrew and the Greek texts from the original manuscripts. Then after you, you get some rendition of the manuscripts in the original language, which is Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, then the process of translation begin. Now I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the context here in the English language. So we trans, uh, translate Hebrew and Greek into the English text. And then after it's uh, translated to English, we begin reading the Bible, and the Bible then... Uh, is understood in our minds, we comprehend it mentally, and while we read it, the Spirit moves and God's Word renews our mind through the ministry of the third person of the Godhead. And then after that, we will then be empowered by the same Spirit who made us understand the Scriptures to apply this into our lives. And then we start reflecting God's word through holy living. And because of that, we then communicate God's word through people as they look at our actions and listen to our words. So if you want to look at the entire quarter, this is the flow of what's going to happen. You start with revelation to inspiration, canonicity to textual criticism, all the way to communication. For the purpose of our lesson this coming Sabbath, I have four parts uh, for dimensions of the scriptures, its source and origin, and its purpose, and we will begin with what I call inspiration. Uh, Luke 24 is a good passage to read to understand exactly what the Bible is about. Uh, it says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You know, the story, it was the resurrection morning, the, the, then when these uh, two disciples eventually, after they were so forlorn, they were mourning the death of Jesus, uh, later in the afternoon they were walking to Emmaus, and Jesus joins them, and they start talking, hey, why are you so sad, Jesus says, and, and then they say, are you the only one in Israel who do not know? 
and the irony was he was the only one who did know what happened. And this is the very pivotal verse in the chapter. And it says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. If there was one sermon in the Bible I would have loved to listen to, yeah, there's a lot of sermons. You got the Sermon on the Mount, you got the Sermon of Peter, uh, you got the Sermon of Paul. One sermon, a Bible study I would have loved to be engaged in would have been with these two disciples because it was Jesus himself conducting the Bible study and talking about the scriptures about himself. So what was exactly uh, the prophets, uh, Moses and the prophets? Uh, you're going to cover this in Ezra and Nehemiah and, and the study in last quarter. But let me review this. But when we talk about uh, the Bible during the time of Jesus, obviously there was still no New Testament We've been talking about Tanakh, and there were no vowels then, so it was T and K. But the Tanakh stands for the Torah, the Nevim, and the Ketubim. The Torah are the books of Moses, the first five books, we call it Pentateuch, or the books of the law. And then the Nevim are prophets, from Joshua all the way to Malachi. I got, I got a diagram and a chart for you later on in our study to expand this some more. And then the Kuthibim, Kuthubim are the writings from the Psalms to the Chronicles. So, so many times the Jews referred to both the prophets and the writings as just the prophets. So you end up having the Tanakh. And this is what Jesus was doing. Jesus started talking to them about Moses, the Torah, the Pentateuch, the prophets and the writings. What all this said about himself and what, that he needed to die so that he can be brought into glory and earn the salvation that men badly needed. So what's this scripture? Uh, a couple more verses comes to mind. We go to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Most of you guys know this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the men of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay, so how, mu how, many, how much of the scripture? All scripture, it's not, it doesn't contain the word of God only. It is the word of God. But somehow, because God is on in a different dimension, we cannot know God in his eternal dimension. He had to infiltrate our dimension. And by talking to prophets and apostles, uh, by the way, let me say something about that before I forget. What was the authoritative word in the Old Testament were the prophets. If you were a prophet, God spoke to you directly. And in the New Testament, the authority were then the apostles. The apostles were the ones who were in direct contact with Jesus, who was the final revelation of God. So we always say apostles and prophets. But all of the words given to the prophets and the apostles were from God. It was clothed in human language, but the word was from God. So we called the Bible the word of God. And all of the scripture is given by inspiration. But what's inspiration? You know, 2 Peter 1.21, a very familiar text as well. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Notice that carried along. You see a picture of a sailboat. And the boat will not move unless the wind blows the sail. And uh, that, that, that meaning is buried into the original word that you use here. Inspired is being blown by the wind, so to speak, by the Holy Spirit. So they were not writing on their own, okay? Just by the will of men or just by the thinking of men. But rather, they started writing and talking while the Holy Spirit was moving in them. And... Again, I have to give this to you. We, we covered this in several of our lesson preview, but this is so apropos with our study right now. When we say all the New Testament, we actually talk about covenant, new and old, old and new covenant, all the New uh, Testament. So basically, the, the everlasting covenant is what we're talking about. And we, I mean, especially in, in our Adventist uh, context, in our in our theology, in our beliefs, we know that there is a cosmic conflict between Christ and Satan, and, and we know for sure even COVID-19, the coronavirus, is because of sin. And I mean, ultimately, you will see God allowing this, but Satan is really the author of turmoil and crisis and death. 
and God is trying to show the world and the universe the bad outcome of sin. So his name will be vindicated. But this stems from a cosmic conflict. And the cosmic conflict is, is, is played out within the everlasting covenant, which is the plan of redemption from eternity to eternity. We're going to co we cover this. So if you look at the Bible from Old and New Testament and Old and New Covenant, then we'll, we'll better understand that the whole scriptures was not given just a historical record or a literary masterpiece, but it was given in order for us to see God unfolding in the plan of redemption for man. So this is another uh, slide that will probably be useful, the, the Old Testament outline, uh, narratives and stories that's happening. You're, you're, we start with creation, the fall, all the way to the return. We, we, we have been... There was a proliferation of this information in the last couple of quarters we studied because all of these guys um, talked about how the Israelites were taken to exile, you know, all the way to the one and the silent years. And then, of course, I have to put this in too. There is a Bible timeline. This will be very useful for you to see how the progression of the books were written over that 1600 period or so. So inspiration allowed God uh, to reveal his word through chosen men, the chosen people, and those were the prophets and the apostles. So remember, they were not speaking on their own. They were speaking the movement of the Spirit. Uh, there's not a whole lot of time to discuss this, but there's a big, big issue whether it's like a word for word, a verbatim dictation. Was it a dictation from the Holy Spirit when they wrote this? Or was it the, the prophet or the apostle writing things in his own words? Of course, when you look at the evidence, uh, you have a farmer, okay? you have a king, you have uh, royalty, you got poor, rich, and all the authors of the scriptures varied from their lifestyles. And they spoke God's word in their own context, in their own culture, in their own language. So uh, at least I know from a denomination, we subscribe more to a thought inspiration rather than a verbatim or a dictation inspiration. So we're basically saying that the Holy Spirit infused God's thoughts into the prophet and the apostles. And through the infusion of the thoughts of God, he used his own language, his own grammar, and he wrote the Word of God. That was inspiration. Regardless of what happens, it is still the Word of God. It doesn't only contain the Word of God. It was the Word of God clothed within human language, written by selected people, so that uh, he can reveal the plan of redemption to those who will read. Okay, after inspiration, we go to the next dimension. It is the dimension of illumination. Uh, and illumination is where uh, you, Illumine, light is given because it was dark, now you can see. And this is one of the most fascinating part of the story in Luke 24. Luke 24, 30 to 31 says, you know, Jesus was, was, was acting as if he was moving forward. And during their time, there was no electricity. The two disciples said, hey, don't, don't go, don't go. Just stay, stick around, just stay here. Spend the night with us. It will be a lot safer here. So they did. And they went in. And of course, customary in the Eastern custom is to feed your guests. Okay, they gathered at the table. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Uh, I've always been intrigued when I read this. I, why in the world he was spending hours walking to emails from Jerusalem. I think the distance was about 20 to 30 kilometers or miles. But so they, they spent a lot of time talking about the scriptures. And while Jesus was talking, opening up the Bible to them, they were, they were kept from recognizing him. You know, uh, that's, that's what the text said. They were kept from recognizing him. Why did they not recognize him? And all of a sudden, their eyes are open. And it's very, very beautiful when I read this commentary. It's when Jesus broke the bread, notice what happens when he breaks the bread. He opens up his hands and the scars show. And when the scars show, they know that he was 
the crucified Savior that is risen from the dead, and they saw him. Uh, I'll go back to this later on in the study. But what keeps our eyes from recognizing Jesus is we do not look at what Jesus says in the lens of the cross. The only way to understand the Bible is when we look at Jesus from the lens of the cross. That's illumination. The Holy Spirit starts moving us. And how, how powerful is this? In 1 Peter 1, 8, it says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. Imagine, Christ is already so far removed when Peter wrote this. Several years have passed when Jesus ascended to heaven. They had, these people who were converted to Christianity, they had no, had no clue how he looked like. They were not there physically with him. They were just listening to the apostles reporting what they did with Christ, what they heard from Jesus. And yet these people loved him and they believe in him. <laughs> you know, what else? And they rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Why? How, when are they doing this? I, I deliberately put this slide here. Because they were filled with joy while Peter was writing them. When they were being fed into the beast in the arena, into the lions, they were dying, being martyred for the faith. That's illumination. When the Spirit so moves in you and you understand the good news of the gospel as Jesus is revealed in the Bible, it gives you courage where you can even stand death for the sake of the one who died for you and for your Lord. You might very well remember Thomas uh, when they were in the upper room. Said, I won't believe you guys. You're just making up stories. Unless I see his hands and his feet, I will not believe. So Jesus shows up, you know, right? And, and then Jesus said, hey, why don't you put your hand on my side? And then Thomas fell on his knees and he said, bless my Lord and my God. He saw Jesus alive and he started believing. And then Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. There's a point. The point is, how do we get to believe today without seeing Jesus? We're 2,000 years removed from Jesus Christ. We get to do that because we have the Bible. When you read the Bible, it gets into your mind and the Holy Spirit works in your mind and that working goes into your heart and then you see with your heart through the eye of faith who Jesus is. And then you declare, my Lord and my God, as Thomas did. Something very important. John 5, 39, this is actually connected to 40, I didn't include that, but during the time of Jesus, people believed that by reading the scriptures, you can have eternal life, you will be saved. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Actually, verse 40 says, but you don't want to come to me and have that life. So Jesus is saying, you've been reading the Bible. In fact, uh, because it was oral tradition, a lot of people, most of the people during the time of Jesus were illiterate. They couldn't read right. So the only way to pass on this tradition was orally. So people memorized this through poems, through songs, orally, and most of them almost like memorized the Bible. But Jesus is saying you search and study the scriptures because you think by reading them you can have brownie points and you can go to heaven. No, no, no. It's all of them points to me. If you don't come to me, you've missed the point of the Bible. Uh, you carry this over in Romans 3, 21. Paul says, But the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, all that the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Let's, let's connect the two verses. The, two, the verse says, All of the scriptures point, the law and the prophets testified of Jesus. And then Paul over the sudden said, oh, Yes, the law and the prophets bore witness to it, testified. What were they testifying to? They were testifying to the righteousness of God. So I put this diagram for so long. It has been very helpful. I've had this for over 20 years, probably more, to help understand that Christ is the center of the scriptures. I, I kind of modified this from Irving Jensen. He's probably one of the better guys in terms of diagramming the scriptures. Uh, here's the Bible. You look at the, you got 
66 books of the Bible. You got 39 in the Old Testament. You got 27 books in the Old Testament. If you go to the literary genre, you got promise. You got anticipation types experiences, you know, poetic and historical books, uh, and then uh, prophetic books in the Old Testament. And then the Gospels were narratives. Acts and the Apostles were a lot of narratives, mostly epistles and letters. And then, of course, Revelation is the Apocalypse. Uh, the breakdown of the ranges of the book, based on the way we've laid it out in the English Bible, is from Genesis to Revelation. You see at the bottom of the diagram. But look at the middle. It's saying, in the books of the law, there was promise. The rest of the books in the Old Testament was anticipation, types, experiences, prophecies. You see the, you see the, the, the tabernacle, the sanctuary. You see the, the exile. You see the, the covenants made to Abraham, David, and all the way to the silent years. They were waiting for the Messiah to come. We studied in, in Ezra why, how Satan wanted to wipe out God's people so the Messiah, the seed of the woman, would be born and how God miraculously delivered them so many times so that Jesus would be born. And finally, when they go to the New Testament, in the Gospels, the seed of the woman is manifested. The Gospels, Jesus is born in flesh. We could see him, people talk with him, God with us, the temple, his tabernacle with us. So he, he was manifested. And then, but despite the fact that he was manifested, walked with him for about three years, when Jesus was, was arrested, they started running away like dogs with their, with their tail behind their legs because they were so scared. They did not understand what Jesus was all about. They thought he's going to be a conqueror like David is going to destroy the Roman regime and the Jews will have their independence. Not until Acts and the epistles did they understand what Jesus was all about. That's why realization came. Then after the church grew and all of, all of this happens even within the 2,000 years that have passed, a revelation will come. The end will come. Jesus will come. Uh, so even with the COVID-19, the coronavirus, I mean, <laughs> you know the, the, end, the end game. What will be the final outcome? Jesus will triumph. Jesus will win. He will change his whole world. So if you're with Jesus Christ, who cares? You know, he, he will run the show and he will put his own timeline. If you're with him, he doesn't make mistakes. You stay with him. But the bottom line is you read all the Bible and the Bible, all of the Bible points to Jesus Christ. And that Christ event is basically the central testimony of the scriptures. So how do we understand the Bible? And I have about four slides here. This is what they call hermeneutics. That's a very fancy word for the, uh, the way you interpret something or in, in, in when you get biblical hermeneutics, the principles of interpretation. So the Bible interpretation process is this. If you see, uh, you go to the left side, you start with exegesis. Exegesis is reading something out of a text. It is what did God say in an ancient context. Uh, and then we consider the biblical audience, the Bible in its original context. So this is what happened like Years ago, originally, when the word came to the inspired writer. Then after that first phase, it goes into a universal principle relevant to God's people in the world at all times. It's a particular biblical event or biblical situation with a universal and a general principle. This is what we call theology. And then once you get to theology, the basic principle from the original intent of the inspired writer. The challenge then is what does God say in our modern context? This is then what we call exposition. Uh, that's why the challenge for a lot of preachers today is expository preaching. Expository preaching means basically you got to go to the exegesis, look at all the theological principles, and after you do research, then you stand in the pulpit you expose God's word because you have buried yourself in study and you're sure that you're as close to the word of God as possible as the original inspired writer intended it to be. Then, of course, the audience is the modern audience, the Bible read, taught, and applied in the modern context. Seen from a different light, I like this. It's very grainy, but this is a, the cycle or of, of, of hermeneutics. You start with the original language, you have an exegesis, you end up with biblical theology. Uh, so the, the, the whole quadrant to the left is what it meant, 
what it meant then, then you are bridged with historical theology in the middle, and the receptor then, the day who reads the translated text, ask the question, what does it mean? What does it mean? Yes, fine. You're talking to me about the experience of the children. What does it mean? The, you, then you systematize the theology from, from biblical to historical to systematic theology. And then you go to what we call homiletical theology. Homiletics is a fancy word for sermons, sermon making. And then and only then you begin to apply what the word is. So you're talking about meaning on the left side, which is a text and context, which is significance, on the right. I've gave this to you for a while. That I, I love this when I do preaching seminars um, wherever I can. I, I always include this graphic because this is a summary of what we've been trying to talk about. Whenever you preach or you teach the Bible, you want to make sure you do not start with the present <laughs> because uh, very common today, especially with the postmodern culture, the first question you see in small group Bible studies is, how do you feel about the text? That's not Bible study. You're trying to read into the Bible when you think about how do you feel. The question in a Bible study is, what is God telling me? What is God revealing? How do you do that? You begin with the original text, with the original language. So you go with the ancient world to go, go towards the left. This is what we call an exegesis. Or analyze the context, the culture, what the inspired writer was writing, the, whether it's a prophet or an apostle. What was he writing about? You know, look at the, look at the background of whatever words he was writing. What, what thoughts were the, the, the Holy Spirit injecting to his mind so that he wrote them down. And then after you read that and understand the context, you look for a general principle, and then you assimilate this, which becomes theology. And that's where you start bridging to the present, from the ancient to the present. I mean, now we call it homiletics because we now apply what you've assimilated after you did the analysis in the text. There's another grid that uh, kind of helps out. There's the exegetical, the theological, homiletical. Uh, first, you start with the biblical language, you go to timeless language, and then you have a contemporary language. First, it's time-bound to biblical author in the audience. Uh, the, the theological it covers all time, and there's no specific audience in view. And the homiletical, uh, applied to a contemporary preacher and audience, one starts with technical wording, there's non-technical wording, there's application wording, there's information and meaning orientation, there's a systematic organization in the middle, and then application and motivation. So you read this, it will help you. If, if, if you want to you wanna look at it in terms of what's going on every weekend, even whether it's Sabbath school or second service, your Bible teacher or your pastor will have to go do the work of analyzing the passage for you. So they, they want to make sure that what they're saying is the Word of God. You know, like John MacArthur is saying, I have no ideas to give you. All I'm giving you, all I'm feeding you is from the kitchen of heaven. It's coming from God. My job is not to mess up the serving. I want to make sure that what I'm saying is truly biblical. How important is it? Because if you, if you get the wrong, if you get the wrong information, people already seen that. If you're, you administer the wrong medication for COVID-19 instead of you healing, you probably can die. So it's very important to, to, to see the truth. And truth is in God's word. And in order for you to, to share the truth, you must first understand exactly what God was trying to say. That's the run through exegesis. And then once, once you see that, you begin to see a general principle, a universal principle that can then be applied. So how do you start, a, by, for example, for a small group Bible study? First question you need to ask is, what was God trying to say to those people then? Okay, because they've experienced this and this is what happened to them. What is their experience and their encounter with God telling us? What is the principle that we need to follow? And as, as, when you establish that, then you ask the question, how does that principle apply to me now? So instead of asking, how do I feel about this? You can say, this is what God wants me to do. This is what God wants me to hear. Then you're more secure because you know you're in the will of God. So um, my favorite illustration here is basically there was an allegory between the cave and the sun. So one day the cave was saying I've been in the darkness for so long, let me go out and check out the light. So he goes out of the cave, and the cave sees the sun. Oh, so this is what light looks like. Uh, he's talking to the sun. And the sun says, yeah, isn't it pretty? It's beautiful, huh, when you have the light. And then uh, the cave says, oh, no, 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 
wait till I show you what darkness is. Why don't you come with me and I will show you the darkness. So according to the allegory, um, the sun went inside the cave. And as the cave uh, took a hold of the sun's hand and moved the sun into the deep recesses of the cave, the sun said, now, show me your darkness. Uh, they were not allowed to see because the sun wasn't in there. If I may borrow the term. When Jesus comes in into your Bible study, he will ask you, hey, show me your darkness. I mean, while you're having a problem with this pandemic, you, some of you are financially insecure now. Some people have loved ones in the hospital. You can even visit. It's like, it's a crisis. Everything is dark. When Jesus comes in, Jesus tells you, hey, feed on my word. Sense my presence and show me your darkness. It won't be there. So we go to the third dimension. The third dimension is preservation. Uh, uh, it's not really within the passage in Luke 24, but it's, I think, implied. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. Isaiah 48. Uh, one example of this is in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Peter is talking here while he was addressing his audience in the church in general. So it's called the general epistles. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him as he does in all his letters and when he speaks in them all this matters. So Peter was already alluding to the fact that there was already a collection of letters from Paul and the apostles were reading whatever they wrote. So like I said, the apostolic testimony and their, their words were the authority in the New Testament is the prophetic testimony and the prophetic writings were the testimony and authority in the Old Testament. So somehow the Spirit who inspired the writings of the Bible, who illumines the reader of the Bible, is the same Spirit who preserves the Bible, collects the Bible. Uh, Voltaire had this to say, in 20 years, Christianity will be no more. My single hand shall destroy the edifice it took 12 apostles to rear. 100 years from my day, there will not be a Bible in the earth except one that is looked upon by an antiquarian curiosity seeker. You know, Voltaire and atheism, rationalism in France. You know, it's very really ironic when <laughs> Voltaire died, they converted his house into a depository of a Bible society in France. So I Bernard Ram had this. Very beautiful. A thousand times over, the death knell of the Bible has been sounded, the funeral procession formed, the inscription cut out on the tombstone and committal read, but somehow the corpse never stays put. No other book has been so chopped, knife, sifted, scrutinized, and vilified. What book on philosophy or religion or psychology or letters of classical or modern times has been subject to such a mass attack as the Bible, with such venom and skepticism, with such thoroughness and erudition upon every chapter, line, and tenet? The Bible is still loved by millions, read by millions, and studied by millions. I was the spirit who preserved the Bible. It remains to be the best seller and give you more statistics towards the end of our study. But the same spirit of inspired and illumines us, preserved the Bible throughout these 2,000 years. I'll give you some background out as to how the preservation took place. The Old Testament manuscripts, the, the scribes who wrote them were professionals. They believed they were transcribing the Word of God and were therefore very careful. The earliest copy of the Old Testament in its entirety is the Masoretic text written in Hebrew from around 980. Mark that, that date, 980, because that's going to play a part in a further explanation that I'm going to give. 980 is a complete manuscript of the Old Testament. Why is it important? Because when Jesus came, he used the Bible. And the Bible that Jesus used was the Old Testament. He had no New Testament then. So during the time, he studied in Esther and Nehemiah after the Medo-Persians or the Persian Empire, Alexander comes in and he conquers the world. 
And one of the contributions of Alexander in Alexandria was the authorship of the Septuagint. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Of course, Alexander had a very vast empire and the, the language spoken then was Greek or Hellenistic. So they had to translate even God's word into Greek. And that's what we call the Septuagint translated by 70 Jewish scholars. Septuagint is something to do with 70. Uh, so it was written in about 200 BC and is what Jesus in the New Testament writers quoted from and strongly agrees with the Masoretic text. Okay, you understand this, okay? The Masoretic text is about 900 AD. Read that. When Jesus was on earth, the apostles and Jesus quoted mostly from the Septuagint, written about 200 BC. A uh, question is, wow, 900 AD, 200 BC, that's over a thousand years. I mean, how in the world can I, can I be assured that it was preserved? Oh, something happened uh, in the 1950s. There was a Bedouin uh, by the Dead Sea, it's throwing rocks. It was so bored, it was throwing rocks in one of the caves. And then he started hearing clink, 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 clink. There was like, uh, like pottery being broken. He goes in there and that began the discovery of what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, the summary of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The uh, Dead Sea Scrolls was so famous, uh, it, it took its rounds, it took its tour. It was displayed in the University of Chicago for several weeks. I remember my niece, when she was still alive, giving me the article in the Chicago Tribune. It was in the, in the museum in the University of Chicago. The Dead Sea Scrolls comprise thousands of fragments from every book of, of the Hebrew Old Testament, except for Esther. That's, that's interesting. Including a complete copy of Isaiah. They were dated between 300 BC to 180, over 1,000 years earlier than the Masoretic text. He's, he's, are you seeing this? 980 for the Masoretic text, which is now accepted as the basis for the translation of the Old Testament. Now we have a, a find, an archaeological find, which is like about 300 years before Jesus came. And Jesus used this Masoretic text supposedly. How accurate is it? The Dead Sea Scrolls agree at 95% level with the Masoretic text. The remaining 5% is due to spelling changes and some, some syntactical structures. Well, what is this saying? The Bible that Jesus and the Apostles were using was the same Bible that's reflected in the Masoretic text that has been translated to our language today. Yeah, I want to clarify this. One of the arguments that people say, oh, how can I believe the Bible? It's like a telephone game. You know, the telephone game, you play this, you, somebody whispers something to the ear of the person, they whisper until by the time it gets to the front, then I, uh, an ant has turned into an elephant because it has morphed itself into something really bizarre while it was being transmitted from one person to the other. That's not the way Bible translation is. It's not passed from one person to the other. Every Bible translation goes to the original manuscript, and once they get to the original manuscript, they translate it into a language. What, what does that mean? When they translated the Old Testament English that you have right now, they based it on the Masoretic text in 900 AD. Okay, so you ask, oh, that, but that's 1,100 years removed from you know, what Jesus was saying. What, when the Dead Sea Scrolls came, after the archaeological find, they proved that the same Masoretic text, the basis of the English translation, was a translated form of the scriptures during the time of Jesus. No less than our Lord used that, the version of scriptures when he was here. Uh, other, the other issues, are, are, you know, the, how do you believe whether a, a, a historical record is accurate? You know, like, I don't know, 100 years from now, uh, if the Lord tarries and we are not yet in heaven, so I'll probably be dead. <laughs> and somebody opens up the historical books. Oh, way back in the year 2020, a pandemic hit the world and uh, uh, millions of cases were confirmed and thousands of people died. Uh, how do I know if it's right? Well, you look for manuscripts, right? And the closer the manuscript is, to the event in history, the more accurate it is. Much more, the more manuscripts you have, the more accurate it is. So 
if I were 100 years in the future, just, just imagine with me for a while, and I can give you uh, a clipping from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Chicago Tribune, you know, taken 100 years before, it was an actual article, oh yeah, that, that's, that's pretty close. If, if, if the date in the article is, I don't know, uh, December or even October of the, the year 2020, that's still pretty close to the event. Now, if I'm reading from the Time Magazine, I'm reading from Newsweek, I'm reading from the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, the Chicago Tribune, the LA Times, the more I have, the more corroboration I have for the event. So, here's the thing. How accurate is the Bible in terms of this criteria? Look, uh, there's a breakdown of the famous ancient books that we have. The Iliad of Homer, it's written in 800 BC. The time span of the manuscript, the earliest manuscript that we find is 900 years. There are 650 extant manuscripts. The Annals of Imperial by Tacitus, 700 years apart. The Jewish War of Josephus, 900 years. But now you start looking at the Greek New Testament, they're only 100, 200 years apart. And look at the manuscripts. I mean, the, the number of manuscripts and the, the time distance between the event and the recording. Um, that's why the accuracy of the Bible is uh, tested based on historical uh, criteria, which stands the scrutiny of experts because it's a very accurate document. There are more than 5,000 different ancient Greek manuscripts containing all or portions of the New Testament that have survived to our time. These are written in different materials. There are over 1,000 copies and fragments of the New Testament in Syria, Coptic, Armenian, Gothic, and Ethiopic, and 8,000 copies of the Latin Vulgate, some dating as far back as Jerome's original in 384 to 400 AD. The number of manuscripts of the New Testament, the very translations from it, and of quotations from it, and the oldest writers of the church is so large that it is practically certain that the true reading of every doubtful passage is preserved in some one or the other of these ancient authorities. This can be said of no other ancient book of the world. It's from Sir Frederick Canyon, Bible and Archaeology. The interval then between the dates of the original composition, the earliest extant evidence becomes so small as to be in fact negligible. And the last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to us substantially as they were written has now been removed. Both the authenticity and the general integrity of the books of the New Testament may be regarded as finally established. Uh, I'm not, I may be in, in, in the future lesson preview, I kind of covered this, I think, when we had the quarterly on Galatians, but uh, Gary Habermas is one of my favorite uh, apologists for the Christian faith. Gary Habermas completed his doctoral studies in the University of Michigan, and his dissertation was on the resurrection. It's a secular campus, but they were talking about, and, and they, they said, will, will my major professors approve this? And, and then the, the, inter, the, the reviewing panel said, yeah, yeah, we will allow you to do that, but don't ever say in your research that the Bible said so. We don't want that. You want to give us the scientific evidence. Long story short, he, he, fa he passed the, the examination, wrote the dissertation in flying colors. And he proved the, the Bible and the resurrection of Jesus to be true with the minimal facts argument. The minimal facts argument is if you throw away all this Christian bias, can you still prove that the Bible? He has now researched over 10,000 authors believing that the most accurate historical event testified historically is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And part of the discussion is the authenticity of the New Testament. So he traces what the, the critical scholars who didn't believe in Christianity and doesn't believe in the Bible and God, they, they recognize Paul as an authoritative historical source because he was a scholar. And so say they read the book of Galatians or the, the epistles of the New Testament as authoritative. And after all this analysis, they look at the timing that Paul had. Paul basically dates back his understanding of the gospel to about three years after Jesus resurrected. But when Paul gives his gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, if it was passed on to me. Who passed it on to him? Which means if it was passed on to him, it was already there. 
And who passed it on to him? James, Peter, John, the big wigs. And then James, Peter, and John said, we just passed on something that the community already believed. And if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, the way it's written, it's da 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 it's, it's a poem. It's a song that has been sang. So one of the most critical scholars in, 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 in New Testament and ancient history says, we can date back the New Testament and the evidences that the disciples saw the risen Christ to about six months after the resurrection of Jesus. That's amazing. It's amazing. So he, the authenticity and the historicity, the historicity of the Bible cannot be questioned. And at least some... Uh, some information that will be helpful. These are the actual chronological order of the Old Testament books. Uh, these are the orders of the New Testament books, uh, some timelines you can follow. Uh, and then the sequence of the New Testament canon, how it was put together. A canon is a measuring read. It becomes a standard. So you can only be part of the canon if, in fact, you've, you've been accepted by the Christian community and through a rigorous process of, of rules and filtering, they'll, they can establish the fact that you were really inspired, given by God, you'll become the canon. So this is the, the, the history of how the New Testament became part of the canon. Uh, other questions people ask is, uh, what about the chapters and the verses? We don't have chapters and verses in the original manuscripts. Uh, Stephen Langton developed the chapter divisions. Uh, there was a Hebrew, a Jewish rabbi, Nathan, in 1448. Uh, he divided uh, the Hebrew Old Testament into verses. And then Stephanus, Robert Esteen, divided the New Testament into standard numbered verses in 1555. That's why we now have chapters and verses in the Bible. Uh, it helps us understand it's more easier to communicate with, when we do Bible study. But really, when push comes to shove, Sometimes it throws us off because the original manuscripts didn't have chapters and verses. So it would be good if you look at a modern translation of the Bible, they do not only put it in chapters and verses. They put it in paragraph forms. And sometimes the paragraph spans across chapters. So uh, just bear that in mind when you do Bible study, contextual Bible study that is. This is a, a summary of what it means to translate the Bible. There's a word-for-word -word translation, which is a formal equivalent, the literal and form base. There's a thought-for-thought, -thought, which is a dynamic equivalent. And the paraphrase, which is a functional equivalent. I'll give you an example. When I say uh, in, in Filipino, we call it iniibig kita. Uh, you can literally translate and say, love I you. Yeah, that's the way the literal translation is. That's more word for word. Now, if I go thought for thought, I'll say, I love you. I rearrange the subject and the predicate, but it's still saying the same thought. But it's not close to the original text. And if somebody wants to be, if somebody wants to be more dramatic, I say, I'm madly in love with you. That's a paraphrase. Okay. Uh, here's a breakdown. You look at all the, you can look at all the versions there where they line up in the spectrum. Um, word for word, you got the interlinear Bible, the New American Standard Bible, the Amplified Bible, English Standard Version, Revised Standard Version. You got Thought for Thought, New Revised Version, New American Standard, uh, New Century Version. And then you got the paraphrase, which is the NARV. You got the Good News Translation, CEV, the Living Bible, and the Message, which I love the Message. It's very dramatic, but it's a paraphrase. It's not that. So what's, what's the lesson here? The lesson basically here, it would be good to study the Bible in different versions. And I, I, I'd favor going to what do we call is a formal equivalent, which word for word first, and then read something thought for thought. And if you want to be more dramatic, you know, more appealing, particularly for young people when they study, a paraphrase will help. But be sure you read the original language first, close, go to the close original, so that when you do teach, you're close to what God intended to give. Uh, this is an interesting graph. Uh, these are the 15 most popular Bible translations in the reading level. Uh, take this with a grain of salt, but... Uh, 
my favorite version, at least now, is e the ESV because it's readable, but it's it's probably one of the closest to the original translation <laughs> based on this graph. It's for grade 10. And ASB and RSB is 11 and 12. Uh, the message is for grade 4 and 5. Uh, I love, I see a lot of high school students reading the message, you know, we got, we got to grow. <laughs> Look for them. So take this with a grain of salt. Uh, something very fascinating, too, it's not the Bible because we, we've changed into a, a digital age. Now with the coronavirus, people are meeting digitally, electronically. And the same also with the Bible. A lot of people don't read the Bible now, the hard copy. They go to their phones, they go to their computers, they go to their iPads. And uh, one guy <laughs> thought of something. Hey, why don't we put uh, the Bible in that platform? Uh, and they did. And that's what we call the U-verse, the Holy Bible. Uh, they just celebrated their 10th year. They started in July 10, 2018. 2018 was their 10th year, the decade. And they look at the history. There were 70 billion chapters read using the U-verse, 12 billion audio chapters listened to, and 4 billion highlights, bookmarks, and notes. Over 83,000 installs of the apps in all the portable mobile devices. It's been translated into 1,209 languages. It's available for people, you know, using their iPhones in, in Asia, in Chinese, in Korea, in Japanese. Uh, in 2019 alone, this were the statistics, 35.6 uh, billion chapters read, just, just 2019, 5.6 billion audio chapters played, 2 billion highlights and bookmarks, that's 1.1 billion Bible plan days completed, 478 million verses shared, 400 million cumulative Bible app installs, just for one year. I'm pretty sure when 2020 is done with the COVID-19, a lot more people would have been reading the Bible. There are currently 6,880 languages in the world spoken by over 7.4 billion people. 648 languages are with Bibles. There's still a very big challenge. We got 3,655 languages with no scripture. I mean, I've been saying this under my breath. It would probably be nice if the Lord is so gracious to me and give me more years to my life. I hope I can get involved into in a Bible translation project one of these days because I think that's one of the most fulfilling missions you can do for God. Uh, Bible Society, the Wycliffe Bible Society gives the statistics of scripture and language. One is taken in 2018, other is 2019. I'm going to mention something about a study. Uh, you notice we only have 66, 66 books. Uh, the Catholic Bible, the Douay version, has more books than we have because they include part of the Apocrypha. We'll probably have time to discuss this in the future, but based on some criteria that we follow, the early church followed, they decided not to categorize the Apocryphal books as inspired. So we only have the 66 books, particularly the 39 books of the Old Testament. So we go to the last dimension, which is the, last, which is the dimension of salvation. 2 Timothy 3.15, uh, Paul is talking to Timothy, and how from your childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writing which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Also, Timothy, go ahead, start in the Bible with your grandma and your Eunice and Lois. You've studied them with your grandma and your mother because the Bible is able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, First Peter 1 Peter 1.10 says, Of this salvation the prophets have required and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Uh, you read the, this authors of, the inspired authors of the scriptures and saying, that's oh, one reason why we wrote all of this. And the reason for this is so that people will come to salvation by putting their faith in Jesus. Uh, Paul is more explicit in Romans 10.17. Faith comes from listening to this message of good news, the good news about Jesus Christ. You want to go to a more classical translation. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It is impossible to come to faith unless you hear the word of God. And that word is mediated to us through the scriptures today. Of course, John ends up his gospel by saying, 
all these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He said, if I were to write all the miracles and the teachings of Jesus, the whole world cannot contain it. But then he goes into the disclaimer. Says, but all of this has been written, even if it's only parson, part and parcel of what Jesus has done. These were written so that, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing you might be saved. Of course, the world famous Verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. This is the gist, the gist of the scriptures. So we're landing now. Pastor Simon Dagger is a good friend of Ravi Zacharias, one of the fearless missionaries in the Middle East uh, based in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, persecuted church in the Middle East and Ravi he was Zacharias was saying, I was with him one day, and, and they were crossing the border of Lebanon and Syria, and of course there's a checkpoint, and uh, Sammy always brings Bibles with him to take to people so that they can have copies of God's Word. And, and uh, in the checkpoint, the guard said, Are, do you have any explosives in this vehicle? And it's, oh, yeah, yeah, full of explosives. <laughs> this guy is weird, he's going to get us killed. And then he pulls up one of the New Testament uh, from, from the roof and said, Here, this is dynamite, but it's the explosive that doesn't hurt. Well, Sammy, so, mean, one day, uh, when there was curfew, it's similar to what's going on, I guess, in the Philippines, because there's this quarantine. There was curfew. Uh, they were driving home with uh, his wife, Rose, uh, in the streets of Lebanon, and they, they saw uh, a suitcase on the road. <laughs> that Sammy said, let's stop and pick up the suitcase. <laughs> and then the wife said, what are you doing? We're not supposed to be here. It's curfew right now. You got to pick up the suitcase. But somebody left it there. Anyways, long story short, he picked up the suitcase, brought it home. When they got home, Sammy Dagger opens up the suitcase. And when he opens up the suitcase, you know what he found out? Every square inch of the suitcase was full of money. And that's a business card. So... He calls this man and said, uh, hello, uh, have you lost something? <laughs> this man said, do you have it? Do you have it? Yeah, I have it. Oh, I'm going to go get it. No, you can't get it. It's curfew right now. You just wait till tomorrow. You come. So the man came. And was wondering, looking at Sammy, what kind of man is this? You know, nobody gets that experience and say, tell God, why me? <laughs> you know, I get this. And, and the guy goes, well, I mean, the, the, the absolute honesty that this man has. And what he did was he put his hand into the bag in the suitcase and grabbed a bunch of bills and gave it to Sam. You're a pastor. You can have this for your church. And then Sam, no, 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 no. I don't receive money in my home. You want to give something to my church? You attend church this weekend and bring your money there. So, so this man goes to the church that weekend, and of course he gave the donation to Sammy. And, uh, and Sammy said, you think you've regained your treasure? That's because you got your suitcase back? I'll tell you what real treasure is. He pulls up a Bible and gives it to the man. And the man couldn't stop kissing the Bible. He encountered God with the honesty of Sammy and realized that what's the real treasure is to get the word of God into you. So, I'll throw this in, and I'm talking to a lot of the Adventist audience now because we're talking about the Adventist Sabbath school. There's a video by David Asherick, if you look for it in YouTube, but uh, he said for so long as an Adventist, he has been preaching a set number of topics for any evangelistic series, and Jesus has only been one of the doctrines he was preaching. He didn't realize that Jesus was at the center. He said, if you look at the wheel and look at Jesus as the hub of the wheel, uh, look at the Adventist distinctives, you will see all the S's there. You got state of the dead, spiritual gifts, Sabbath, satanic conflict, salvation, sanctuary, second coming, scripture. All of them are held in place by Jesus. If they are held in place by Jesus, he said, 
what happens if you take off the hub and take Jesus out? All of these things drop and they're gone. I'm saying this, at least in the context of the coronavirus, and people are now, oh, nuts, there's going to be a vaccine, and with that vaccine that they're going to come up, they will implant the chip, and then this will begin the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and the Sunday law, and people start talking about it. People start talking about prophecy and the end times and fear mongering, and they miss Jesus. People won't listen because everything will be in disarray got to put Jesus in the center. Only then will the rest of the distinctives make sense. The Bible doesn't make sense without Jesus because the Bible is about Jesus Christ. The source of the Bible is the Spirit who glorifies Jesus Christ. The preservation, the illumination, and the celebration that's offered is centered on Jesus Christ. So, I'll share this, two more slides, and we're done here. There are three O's. I always uh, share this. Uh, there is orthodoxy, which is right belief. You take from the scriptures. If you read the Bible, you will know what to believe because there's the standard of faith and practice. And there's orthopraxy, the right action. Now that you've read the Bible, like Mark Twain said, as difficult as it is, the way to do it is follow the Bible and act on what you've read. That's orthopraxy. And you can read, you can, you can follow the Bible like the Pharisees, hypocritically, and it will stink. It's legal obedience. So there's orthopathy, which is with the right way, the right motivation. So you, you, the, the three combination comes in. Okay, a, a good illustration is on the right side. Orthodox is the mind. Orthopraxy is the body. And orthopathy is, orthopathy is the soul or the spirit. Thus shall love the Lord the God with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Studying the Bible involves all three. You must learn to study it well, to know exactly what God is saying. You must allow the spirit to move you so you are motivated to follow and put into practice what you've learned. The final analysis uh, is what I leave with you in our preview today. Karl Barth was considered to be one of the best minds in theology, uh, based in Switzerland. Uh, the dogmatics of Karl Barth and the thick books. I read a dissertation on the dogmatics of Karl Barth uh, by Jack Blanco when I was in college, the only copy of a dissertation in our library. And Jack Blanco uh, wrote the dissertation on the dogmatics of Karl Barth. So when he visited the United States, people flocked to the University of Chicago to listen to him. And during the Q&A, back in 1962, a student, student asked Karl Barth if he could summarize his whole life's work in theology in a sentence, all of his dogmatics all of his Bible study. And Karl Barth said, yes, I can. In the words of a song I learned at my mother's knee, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. My prayer is as we study the quarterly and we open up these lessons every week, we will indeed know about the Jesus who loves us because the Bible tells us, even in this pandemic of COVID-19, a book that promises us that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for this uh, preview that we had. It would be a very rich quarter. Uh, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will move your church, move us, with each one of us to study so we can gain a better appreciation of what the scripture is all about. Give us insights on how to understand it better. Give us the right motivation on how to follow it more according to your will and according to your pleasure. And give us methods whereby we can share it to other people so that 
the whole world can say along with us, Jesus loves me as I know, for the Bible tells me so. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.